everyone and welcome to learn A-level biology for free with Miss Estrick. In this video I'm going through the second stage of photosynthesis which is the light independent reaction. So first of all the light independent reaction is also known as the Calvin cycle. So you may have learnt it called the light independent reaction, LIR for short, or the Calvin cycle. And this stage still occurs in the chloroplast and it occurs in the fluid center called the stroma. And within that fluid center or the stroma is the enzyme Rubisco. And that catalyzes the, uh, one of the key stages in the Calvin cycle. So unlike the light dependent reaction, temperature does affect the rate of reaction of the Calvin cycle. And that's because enzymes are temperature sensitive. So this stage in photosynthesis is affected by temperature. So the key molecules involved are carbon dioxide and then two molecules which were made in the light dependent reactions. So reduced NADP and ATP. And these three molecules are used within that Calvin cycle to form a hexo sugar which is the end product of photosynthesis. And that could be glucose, for example. So the ATP is hydrolyzed, and when you hydrolyze ATP, it releases energy. So the energy for this reaction comes from ATP. And the reduced NADP donates a hydrogen atom. And because a hydrogen atom is a proton and an electron, by donating a hydrogen atom, it reduces the molecule which picks it up, which is GP in this case. So let's have a look at the whole cycle. I have the whole cycle here, but we'll go through it a section at a time. And I'm going to start at the top here where carbon dioxide is entering the cycle. So carbon dioxide, which would have originated from the atmosphere, diffusing in through stomata in the leaves will then react with this molecule RUBP or ribulose bisphosphate but for the exam RUBP is fine you do not need to know the full name and when those two react together they do require the enzyme Rubisco to help catalyze that reaction to lower the activation energy and the results of that stage is two molecules of GP, or glycerate three phosphate, which again for AQA, you do not need to know that full name, GP is sufficient. So we have two three carbon compounds. So we've gone from adding one carbon in carbon dioxide with the five carbons in RUBP to create six carbons, although this molecule is two lots of GP, so two lots of a three carbon compound. So the next step is looking at how these two compounds of GP are converted into TP. And TP stands for triose phosphate, but again, you do not need to know that full name for AQA. And this step is the first stage where we see ATP being used and it's also where the reduced NADP is used. So to convert GP into TP, energy is required. So one molecule of ATP is hydrolyzed and the energy released is used for that conversion. The second thing we see the reduced NADP is being used and that is because the hydrogen in reduced NADP is being picked up by that GP molecule and therefore it is becoming reduced. So to go from GP into TP, that is a reduction reaction. So this stage is reduction. The reason being is a hydrogen is gained, or you could say reduced NADP is reoxidized because it is donating hydrogen. So the next part of the reaction then in the cycle is these two molecules of TP, one of those carbon atoms is removed from the cycle each time the cycle happens. 
And once the cycle has occurred six times, you'll then have six carbons have been removed, and that is when a hexo sugar can be fully created. So some of the carbon from the TP leaves the cycle each turn, and that is used to make useful organic substances. Now, AQA just specify organic substances, meaning substances which contain carbon. And we'll come to that shortly, why they use that phrase, rather than saying glucose or hexose sugar specifically. So now we've lost one carbon from TP each cycle. That leaves us with five carbons remaining. And the very last step of the cycle is to regenerate the RUBP so the cycle can continue to happen over and over. And this stage also requires ATP. So that final step of regenerating RUBP does require energy from ATP. So whilst glucose is um, the most common product, as we were saying, AQA used the phrase organic substances. And the reason for that is those hexo sugars can be converted into a whole range of different carbon containing compounds. So the glucose could go on to form disaccharides such as sucrose or polysaccharides such as cellulose for the plant cell wall or starch for glucose storage. Or it could be converted into a different molecule other than a carbohydrate such as glycerol which can then combine with fatty acids to make lipids. So the last thing you need to know in photosynthesis is the idea of limiting factors. And a limiting factor is anything that could reduce the rate of photosynthesis. And this is where you would have to apply your knowledge of the light dependent and independent reactions to fully understand why temperature, carbon dioxide concentration and light intensity have the ability to limit the rate. So temperature, this is going to affect the light independent reactions because it's an enzyme controlled reaction. So therefore, if it's too cold, there's not enough kinetic energy. If it's too hot, the enzymes denature. So you would typically get a curve like this demonstrating the effect of temperature on the rate of photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide concentration has an effect on the light independent reactions because that is one of the reactants that is entering the Calvin cycle. So we can see here this time we have a curve and we have initially the rate of photosynthesis is directly proportional or a positive correlation to carbon dioxide but that curve then starts to level off and eventually it plateaus. And wherever you have the positive correlation, which we see here at the start, that means that at that stage, whatever is on the x-axis is the limiting factor. So at the very um, low concentrations of carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide concentration is the limiting factor. However, at very high concentrations, carbon dioxide concentration is no longer limiting because there's enough of it. So it must be one of these two, which is now limiting the rate where we see the plateau. And that's a similar idea for light intensity. And light intensity is affecting the rate of photosynthesis because it is required in the light dependent reactions for photolysis and for photoionization. So again, at low light intensities, we can see light intensity is the limiting factor. But at high light intensities, we see this plateau in the rate of photosynthesis. So it must now be another one of the two factors is limiting the rate at this stage. So the final thing you could be asked is why those ideas of limiting factors are important. And this links to agricultural practices. So having that knowledge means that um, farmers can manipulate the conditions under which they grow their plants. So they can make sure they provide artificial lighting, heating, and they can burn fuels to provide carbon dioxide to make sure that none of those three factors are limiting and therefore they are going to have their plants growing as efficiently as possible. 
But if you do get an exam question on this, you always have to consider the profits as well. Because to pay for lighting, heating and fuel, there's a big cost involved. So the farmer will have to make sure it is cost effective. Meaning, whatever they are paying for the heat, light and fuel, are they getting more profits because of it? And that is it for photosynthesis and in particular the light independent reactions. <laughs>